post World Baseball Classic hangover. He's back home. First off, we'll get into Hoskins in a second. Ken, welcome back home. How does it feel for a few days? Spring training tour and then World Baseball Classic. It's been a minute. Does your family recognize you? Yeah, they recognize me. And Scott, I don't want to talk too much about how hard I might have been working because, of course, AJ will perceive that as complaining about my job. So let's just celebrate everything about my job. It's great. <laughs> yes. Hey, you had Craig, a fun Craig, you run. missed this the other day, man. AJ completely took words out of context, kind of as he did as a player when I was covering him. <laughs> but, you know, that's how I roll. So whatever. Unbelievable. <laughs> Phrase deals with it every day. AJ and Frazier before the show is going to turn into its own show at some point. Those two going at it before we even start. So, you know, Ken. luckily, Ken, we gave you a break today because there's no AJ. Go ahead, Frazier. Ken, I, I want to jump into something here, man. We talk about baseball all the time. I want to ask you, like, kind of a personal question. How, how, do, you, how do you become an insider? How, is there, like, is there something that you do? Like, I know you go to school, you, 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 you work on everything, but was there one, you know, thing that you got, you got trust from one person or next thing you know, boom, I know you, you, you worked all around, you worked in different spots, but you were good. And then all of a sudden you become that guy. Like, was there a certain something that happened or, you know, does it, you know, just naturally come to you? Actually, Todd, I was at the Baltimore Sun from 91 to 2000, actually from 87 to 2000. First, I covered the Orioles as a B person for four years. Then I was a general sports columnist for nine. So I wrote about all the sports, but Baltimore really had baseball. The Ravens came in the middle of that, but the Orioles were the biggest thing. So in the year 2000, I was kind of not restless, but I was maybe looking for some other things. And my wife, of all people, noticed one day, I think it was Jason Stark, but it might have been Tim Kirkchen. She noticed him, one of those guys, on ESPN. And she goes, hey, you, you were with those guys. You're the same kind of age, whatever. Why can't you do what they do? It had never even occurred to me before. But I started looking around for what is called a national job, not just covering one team, but a lot of different teams, all the different teams. And my sales pitch for that job, which I eventually got at the Sporting News, was the Orioles at the time under Peter Angelos, who was their owner then and now, ran through executives like you can't believe. So it was Pat Gillick, it was Kevin Malone, Doug Melvin, Dan O'Dowd, a lot of these guys, Frank Wren was another one, they had branched out to other teams, and I covered them with the Orioles, so I knew them all. So that was my starting point and kind of my foundation for getting to know different people in the game. I would talk to them, and then obviously once you start covering all the different teams, you meet different people and players. So that was kind of it. If, it. if the Orioles were not such a mess in the 1990s, maybe I would not have this job and be <laughs> where I am today. I don't know. Yeah. But that helped. Yeah, so that, that kind of goes back to our conversation. Like, are you cheering for a bad team or a good team? So if they were bad, that really worked out for you, right? Yeah, but I didn't know, Eric. I, I had no idea that I was even going to look into that kind of job. It, it did not even occur to me really until my wife said something. And well, good for her. Yeah. I, I <laughs> mean, she, she kind of saw, she saw the field better than I did. I, I was kind of probably thinking I'd be at the Baltimore Sun forever and just being a columnist. And hey, at that time, that was a very good job to have. And I, would, I was perfectly happy. So... It really was that more than anything, and it was the fact that all of these different people had been through Baltimore that enabled me to tell the sporting news, hey, I have obviously not the experience doing this that other people do, but I have this foundation of these people. I can start there and go from that point. And you're a good dude. You didn't say that. You're reliable. That's, that's a huge part of it, but... You know, this Thanks. This is your segment, so we've given you enough praise. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> enough, Eric. Let's AJ go. <laughs> texted us. AJ texted me, and he said he's listening. So he just wants you to know. He said, I heard that, Ken. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, heard a okay, lot good. Of, he's heard a lot of things from me. He's going to hear a lot more. Good, 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 good. <laughs> hey, uh, what are you hearing from Philly's camp? What, what, with, with the Hoskins injury, you know, just kind of kind of delve into that awful situation first off i heard what you guys were talking about relative to his free agency and i'll start there because i spoke with him a 
couple of weeks ago about this, and he loves Philly. He wants to be in Philly, and whether that was going to happen or not, who knows. But this clearly changes the equation. And Eric, I think it was you that made the point that you can make the case his numbers are better than Schwarber's at a comparable stage of his career. He's a little bit older, and that's true. The defense has been and was certainly going to be a problem in free agency. Now, you could say Schwarber has the same problem, but he plays the outfield. It's not great, maybe, but it's okay. Hoskins, at first, has not been a great defender, so that might have played into it. But this really, it's such a shame because this was the time when he was going to, of course, be pushing for that big deal. And you guys are right. The Schwarber comparison, the Rizzo comparison, these are all fair guys to look at. So from a personal standpoint, from Reese Hop- Hoskins' career, that is a really difficult thing. For the Phillies, yes, it's also difficult. Now, they do have options. Hall is one of these guys that kind of came up last year, made a strong impression. Didn't look like he had a spot with the Phillies because they're kind of loaded in the corner infield positions, DH. But here he is, and he'll get an opportunity. They also can slide Bohm over, but if I were the Phillies, given the improvements Bohm has made at third base and how hard he has worked at that position, I'd be reluctant to do that. And I would look at Hall and... At that point, come the deadline, if indeed this is a problem with production, then maybe you go out and look around. First base types usually are somewhat available. It's not like a position of scarcity. You can find different guys to do that. It's not a devastating blow for them, but it doesn't help, especially when you don't have Harper to start the season. And they were so excited about their team. And that infield of Hoskins, Stott, Turner, and Bohm looked like it was going to be really good. Now they've got to patch it together a little bit, and it's more of a challenge. But you have to say this, and as cold as it sounds, and you guys know this, every team will go through this at some point in the season. Every contender is going to have a major injury or two. Dodgers with Lux already. The Mets with Diaz. I mean, we can go right down the line, and the season hasn't even started yet. So... It's part of it. It's the worst part of it. It's an unfortunate thing, no question. But from the Phillies' perspective, I think they'll be okay. From Hoskins' perspective, it's more disappointing because of the free agent aspect. You mentioned you mentioned Harper real quick. Should we? We asked uh, we asked Topper yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday he was on. Is is there any significance to the whole 60 day? You know, didn't put him on the 60 day when other teams are putting all their guys on 60 days? I didn't think so. And Dave Dombrowski's explanation was we don't need to do this just yet. So why not leave your options open? Clearly, if at some point they feel Harper is moving along more quickly and yes, it can justify not putting him on the 60 day. I get it, but I just, Eric, did not see that as anything more than if they don't need to do it, why do it? And if there comes a point when they need to do it, they'll do it then. I don't expect him back within 60 days. I think that's a fantasy. That's the one thing that starts that up, though, Ken, is that they're going to miss Harper for about half the season. So from an offensive firepower perspective, yeah, Trey Turner looks like he's on top of the world, but down Hoskins, down Harper, that hurts to start the year. And the one thing I wanted to get from you, we've talked about this in the past, we've worked together for a long time, is the annual reminder, it's time, that trades during this time period rarely happen, trades of significance, because you see those big injuries, like this one with Reese, especially Edwin Diaz a week and a half ago, and Mets fans calling out Alexis Diaz and David Bednar and all these closers on bad teams. That does not mean that's going to happen. So do you want to give your yearly PSA on why trades like this are incredibly rare at this time. They are rare, and it's not that they're unheard of. The Padres have done it a few times, the Kimbrel trade that one year, but it's just really difficult because teams are not willing to give up prospects at this point for the most part. And let's say in the Reds' case, they don't want to give up Diaz and kill whatever minimal hope they have going into the season before the season starts. So... It's just a difficult thing to pull off. Granted, with 40-man roster decisions that will be coming, different guys getting bumped off, you could see the Phillies maybe make a claim on someone or maybe get someone in 
a lesser trade, but I don't expect anything major. Now, that said, I'm not going to rule it out completely, especially in the Mets case, but it's just tough, Scott. I, it's just not the time of year when teams are generally inclined to do things. And you could say that really right up until about July 15th because the way the calendar works, the way teams think, they're just not inclined to push right now. They more likely will want to see what they have and kind of see how it plays out the first couple of months before making a decision. Hey, Ken, I want you to pretend right now, okay? You and me, we're at a bar here in Jersey. We're just shooting the shit, all right? So <laughs> talking baseball, I'm going to bring up a situation about Chris Russo, his comments about the World Baseball Classic. You know, I'm, I'm friends with Chris. You know, me and him bumped heads back in the day. I still think some of his takes are bad. You know, he's, he's commented on some of my fourth. But give me your take on that, man. I mean, he just comes up with this asinine comment about, you know, basically, you know, what, what, why are people even excited about this matchup between Shohei and Trout? I mean, I thought, in my opinion, if you're a baseball fan, this is one of the most spectacular things you're going to see in baseball probably this year. Um, and he comes up with this just crazy ass take, man. What, what, what would you, what would you say on that behalf? Well, Todd, I am friends with Chris too. And I like Chris a whole lot. I think he's actually great at his job. I do think he missed here. And yeah. listen, Chris is a contrarian. He's a guy who does like to stir it up. That's kind of who he is. It's always who he has been. And no one should be surprised that he might have an outlandish take. That's the one thing I'm like looking at all this criticism. Like, really, Chris Russo, you're shocked that he's yeah. going to have some crazy number or now, crazy yeah. thought. Yeah. But with regard to this specific thing that he said, I don't agree at all. And actually, that moment was a completely special moment. It's amazing that it actually happened given the odds of Otani facing Trout with the game on the line in the ninth inning, you couldn't have scripted it any better. And yet in baseball, we rarely see this kind of thing take place. Really, rarely do we envision something and dream of something like that and see it happen just because of the different things that can transpire over the course of a game to disrupt it. So I don't know where he was coming from with that, Chris does love baseball. It's not a question of that, but I just believe he was off here. And again, someone like me, I like different opinions and I encourage people and welcome all kinds of points of view. I think that's healthy. I think that's what we need in baseball and everywhere else. But yeah. that opinion, I just felt it was off. Let's say you didn't feel like it was off and that he was correct. What's the second best? What's the second best uh, matchup that you've ever seen? Because you you followed baseball for a long time. Well, I was at the game in 1988 when Gibson hit the home run, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. There's a man in Los Angeles, a radio guy. I don't know his name. I'm sorry, I don't know. His, I don't recall his name. We're in the press box, the main press box at Dodger Stadium, which is the same today as it was then, okay, 35 years later. And we're crammed in. It's, it's a tight fit. And Gibson's hobbling to the plate, and this guy says to me, radio guy, well, you know, newspaper guys don't respect radio guys as much as they respect newspaper guys. I'll <laughs> lay that out there. Uh, so he says, wouldn't it be great – if Kirk Gibson hit a home run right here, and I'm not all that experienced at that point, but I say to him, pal, he ain't hitting a home run here. There's no freaking way he's hitting a home run here. And the words were out of my lips when, of course, he hit the home run, and it was one of the great things any of us will ever see. So that's the one that definitely stands out to me, Eric, as the best matchup. Now, Trout versus Otani, obviously different circumstances, and this was one of Chris's points. It's not Gibson Eckersley. I know it's not the World Series. We all know it's not the World Series. But the WBC was a great event. It ended with this incredible matchup. Teammates, the two best players in the game. I, I don't know how you can want anything more. And the other thing was, and I wrote this, we didn't see a first pitch pop up here. We saw a seven pitch at bat that was really a fight. Now, it's funny. I wrote that that it was battle or fight, whatever, and fans were like, oh, Trail wasn't even making contact. Yeah, he wasn't making contact because Otani was 
throwing ridiculously hard and then threw that slider at the end. You think Trout wasn't trying? I mean, really. So <laughs> it was a great battle, and it was a tremendous moment to end a tremendous tournament, and 97 98% of the people watching probably felt the same way, and Chris was in the 1% not. Yeah, and you're entitled to your own opinion, and I've known Chris for years too, and I would tell him, first off, you need to go to a game. I guarantee you he has not been to a World Baseball Classic game. If he goes down to Miami and checks out that scene, he'd be like, holy shit. And if you don't feel that I way, agree. there's a problem. I mean, if that doesn't get you excited, saying, oh, I'm not going to get pumped in March, why? We can't have fun in March? Who said that? I mean, is that <laughs> something that was set in stone? Is it a law? Sorry that we had one of the coolest moments that we've been anticipating for a while, the top two maybe talked about players over the past decade plus in our sport facing off. I mean, what could be better? In my mind, that's well, the Scott, only thing. You're entitled to your opinion, but if it's a bad one, we can dunk on it. Well, that's true, of course. But it's also true what you're saying there, that if you don't like the WBC because in your head, your player on your team might get affected, whatever, okay. But what I've said from the beginning, I've said it on this show too, watch the games. Watch the games and tell me it's not a fun event. And that was true going into this WBC. This WBC was elevated beyond anything before. But the games are so good. And I think I said this the other day, guys. Four of the best games I've ever seen took place in this live. And there also is a greater good here. And the growth of the sport is meaningful. That's something important. Now, I know it doesn't affect the Mets if you're a Mets fan. And Edwin Diaz, I, I get it, all that. But my gosh, if you couldn't appreciate this as a baseball fan, and Chris Russo is a baseball fan, if you couldn't appreciate what the tournament was and what that moment was, then I kind of question if you're seeing the sport the right way. Completely well said questioning the fandom there. So let's get back to spring training action and some competitions. There's two we want to hit on. So let's start with the Atlanta Braves because the competition is over and Braves country was freaking out. It was during the WBC, so it was hidden a little bit. We had Michael Harris on yesterday and he's roommates with Vaughn. They're good friends for years. He gave us a little bit of insight of how Vaughn's been very positive about it and says, hey, I'm going to come up soon. It's all good. And Michael Harris is about as straight up nice and positive as a guy as you'll meet. So that's a good guy to be around to kind of just play normal with his buddy, but still a little awkward for him. And for Braves fans, they're not pleased about it, at least at the moment. But what were you hearing about Grissom and um, his chances of coming up with the team pretty soon? Well, a couple of things here. So all winter long, actually not all winter long, but starting in January, I believe, Ron Washington had Vaughn Grissom at his home in New Orleans and he was working with Grissom. Now, Washington is one of the great infield coaches ever. Not just of this time, but ever. And he was confident that Grissom was going to get it. Now, when I went to Braves camp in early, eh, mid-February, I would say, early on in spring training, some of the coaches were saying, hey, watch out for Arcia. Arcia is a good shortstop. He, we would be fine if he was a shortstop. They weren't commenting at all on Grissom in that regard. They were just saying, hey, RC is legit. So it seems, and I haven't been at that camp since then, but it seems to me that Grissom's range is, no matter how much Washington might work with him, going to be a problem. He's maybe not physically a shortstop. So that's why, or that's the genesis of this decision. Now, there's another factor here, and it's the kid Shoemake. And he is a great defender. And I read Mark Bowman of MLB.com, who's covered the Braves for years, wrote yesterday he believes Shoemake's going to make the most starts at shortstop this season for the Braves with Grissom kind of bouncing around. So what the Braves, it seems, are trying to do here is just give themselves the best chance out of the gate, see if Shoemake can develop a little bit more offensively, and maybe see if Grissom can develop a little bit more defensively. But I'm not sure... Grissom is ever going to be a shortstop. And that's not a knock on him as a player. It just might not be who he is. And I remember last year, this discussion was going on because Dansby Swanson was a free agent. And Braves fans like, well, Grissom's playing short in the minor leagues. He'll be fine. Yeah, I get it. Major leagues, a little bit different story. So not going to rule him out. No one should rule him out. Kid has a great work ethic. He's a good kid. And he wants it. But it might just be that 
That's not his spot. Hey, Ken, I'm going to move to a different shortstop position now. Uh, let's, let's move to the Yankees. So I, I'm going to be working 20, 30 games with them uh, with the Yes Network here for pre and post game, which I'm pretty excited about. So I'm probably going to lean on you a little bit during the season here. If, if you, I might be blowing up your phone. But Volpe, let's talk about him a little bit, man. He's impressed all through spring training. Um, they're moving IKF around a little bit. Um, what have you heard about that? We got kind of got an inkling from from uh, Boone the other day uh, that you know he might be making the team and he might be that shortstop. So what what are your thoughts and what have you heard about that? Todd, this is really interesting. This is one of the more fascinating decisions we're going to see toward the end of the spring, and not just because it's the Yankees. It's it's just a really fascinating decision at this point in time in the game, and I'll tell you why. Last year with the new CBA, we had something come out in the CBA called the Prospect Promotion Initiative, PPI. If you carry a guy, a rookie, the whole year, he's a top 100 prospect on two lists, he stays with you the whole year, and he wins rookie of the year, or in his first three years, top three MVP or top three Cy Young, he gets you a draft pick. Seattle Mariners. Julio Rodriguez, they promote him from the start of the year last year. They've got the 29th pick in the draft because he won Rookie of the Year. That's a powerful incentive. Now, wow. if you bring up Volpe and you have him as your shortstop from day one, does it guarantee he's going to win Rookie of the Year? Of course not. But there's another layer here with the New York Yankees. It's a team that is hell-bent on winning the World Series for the first time since 2009. Always claims that they're all about winning. And in most regards, you can't really argue with that. They're going to send down a guy who seems, from everything I hear, to have the support of his clubhouse, support of certain people in the front office, and in many ways should be the guy because he has clearly outplayed Peraza in this spring training competition. And spring training competitions, as you guys both know, can be a bit of a mirage and BS eyewash, but... If you're saying you have a competition, one guy outplays the other, and you're claiming you're all about winning, then what is the justification for sending Volpe down other than service time manipulation and giving Peraza maybe one last shot to hold this thing down before Volpe comes up and is the guy? There's a lot there. There's a lot there, and if you're the Yankees, maybe you want the extra year of control. You keep him down until April 22nd, but if you're the Yankees... You shouldn't care about that because, my gosh, you should be able to retain Anthony Volpe even if he is eligible for a free agency a year sooner. So all of these different things are coming into play. The fact also, Volpe has not played a triple-A. That's part of this equation. It's just a really interesting decision to me. And I am quite intrigued to see where the Yankees go with it. Yeah, hey, there's going to be some news either way. So, And Yankee fans are already convinced, solid. They are ready for Volpe, and if they don't see him, they're going to freak out, especially if the Yanks start like four and five. They are going to be going after it in New York. You know One other thing, Scott, one other thing I should mention here. If you trade Torres by opening day, you've got room for both. And honestly, as good a player as Glaber is, I kind of think the Yankees need to do that and play both these kids up the middle. It's a risk, but you also have DJ. You can also do some other things, too. They need an injection of this kind of youthful energy. And granted, they'll get it either way, but even though it's a risk to play two guys like that fairly regularly, I don't know. They're both quite highly thought of, and you trade Torres for maybe some pitching, and that would kind of be the thing to do. But it gets back to, Scott, what you were saying earlier. Those trades are tough to make. They've tried to trade Torres and haven't been able to do it. But that is the obvious answer to this. Now, the Yankees and their fans are probably thinking, well, we'd rather trade Josh Donaldson. Yeah, I know that you'd rather trade Josh Donaldson, but he doesn't <laughs> have the value that Torres does right now. And Donaldson's a terrific defender. I think he's going to bounce back a little bit, too. And, and Yanks fans were hard on him last year. That's the only thing that stands out to me, though, is do you, do you think there's – a legitimate shot based on conversations that Glaber Torres could be dealt either around this time or at some point this season by the Yanks to make room for that youth movement. That's definitely newsworthy for Yankee fans and, and probably mixed reactions from them. It is 
definitely a possibility. It's something, Scott, that they've been trying to do. They had that deal with the Marlins at last year's deadline. It was Torres, somebody else for Pablo Lopez. It just They couldn't line it up, but it's something that's been discussed before. It's not that newsworthy, actually. So I can see them entertaining that, trying to do that, but it's also going to depend on how these guys perform. Peraza has not had a good spring. What you put into that, how much you weigh that into this, I don't know. Maybe they just believe Peraza is the guy. He's the better natural shortstop than Volpe. And ultimately, that's the way they want to go. And if that's the case, that's fine. And fans are not front office people in terms of evaluation. We, we don't, even media, we don't see things the way they do. Now, they're not always right. But guess what? Fans aren't always right. Media members aren't always right either. No, it's a good little mix. Hey, Ken, enjoy the time at home. I'm sure you'll be hitting the road again soon. We'll talk to you next week for opening week of the season. All right. Thanks, guys.